As Saudi Arabia controls a fifth of the world's oil supply, due to our USA Today from 2018 concludes, the nation has the ability to single-handedly spike oil prices. The impact of rising oil prices is recession. The clear term of the OFW rights in 2013. Since oil is a fundamental component to global economies, rising oil prices trickles down by spiking the prices of overall goods. This decreases consumer spending, causing a downward economic spiral that ultimately results in a recession. Historically, millennia CNBC reports in 2018, high oil prices have contributed and proceeded to every single American recession since World War II. Evans of Reuters quantifies. The last recession pushed 90 million people into poverty worldwide and erased 20 years of poverty alleviation progress. Contention 2 is removing the American security guarantee. Courtsmen of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in 2018, Saudi Arabia's largest deterrent against the Iranian aggression is the American security guarantee. Hennigan of Time Magazine furthers in 2018, arms sales have kept this alliance secure for the past 75 years. As such, ending arms sales to Saudi Arabia and removing this key pillar of our alliance will signal the end of America's security guarantee. Critically, a 2008 support by the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations finds, without the U.S. security guarantee, Saudi Arabia will be forced to take matters of defense into their own hands, compensating for the loss of the American deterrent. Do you know the Middle East Policy Council furthers in 2014? No other countries have the willingness or force projection capabilities to assure Saudi security like America can. Moreover, Fatima al of the National Review Report from 2018. Any arms sales renders their other Middle Eastern alliances uncertain, and as such, these countries will also have to arm to defend themselves. Ultimately, Kordsman concludes, the American security guarantee is the best hope to secure our Arab allies and prevent a devastating regional arms race. Without the security guarantee, Saudi Arabia will likely have to arm past their current capabilities to compensate the loss of the American deterrent. Such an arms buildup would trigger a devastating arms race. Sahar Dunes of Istanbul University explains in 2017, while Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states would perceive their actions as defensive, Iran would fear the potential for the arms to be used offensively. As a result, Dunes finds, Iran has historically pursued arms buildups of their own, unable to take the chance that Saudi's intentions are sincere. Saudi Arabia then responds in kind, accelerating an arms race between the two regional rivals. Zangor of the National Interest explains in 2018, the Saudi Crown Prince is inexperienced, power hungry, and could even take Saudi Arabia nuclear in the interest of national security. The importance of arms races cannot be understated. Richard Stoll of Oxford University was in 2017, as each nation becomes more worried of the other's intentions and more uncertain of attack, the chance that they lash out in fear increases. Indeed, Gibbler of the University of Kentucky concludes in 2005, arms races increase the chance of war by five times. Even if Saudi Arabia and Iran don't attack each other directly, the potential for the creation of new proxy wars or the escalation of existing ones still exists. Indeed, Ostavar of the Naval Post Graduate Explorers in 2018, the most likely manifestation of a Saudi-Iranian conflict would be a regional war waged between allies and proxies in places such as Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and the UAE. Even now, Mohammed Bazi of NYU writes in 2018, more than 50,000 people have died in the current proxy conflict in Yemen, with 22 million more struggling to the war induced famine. A regional war across six times as many countries would be devastating. We were due to vote Can I see Gibbler? Sales, but the alliance completely break. The security guarantee goes away. Why? Because arms sales are our biggest commitment to Saudi Arabia. They're we are willing to go to war in their defense if you're wrong. Don't, don't we also have like military bases and don't they also fall under like our nuclear security umbrella? So one, they're not under a nuclear security umbrella. Two, wait, having, wait, 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 having wait, wait, a military, military nuclear security umbrella. You don't think it's like Iran were to strike nuclearly in Saudi Arabia, we wouldn't use Iran in particular in return? So 
So under the security guarantee, we would. But like this, the nuclear umbrella is part of the security guarantee. With the well, security wait, but guarantee getting rid states, of arms sales does not get rid of our security. So let me explain guarantee. this first. So what the security guarantee says is that if Iran attacks Saudi Arabia, the United States attacks Iran. So obviously, the nuclear umbrella which says, well, nuke Iran falls under that category. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Uh, okay, I think you're like kind of oversimplifying what the security guarantee is. It just, it's not just arms sales, for sure. Okay, so I want to talk about your case on the other. Sure. So the only two like parts that Saudi Arabia military talk about are precision weapons and missile defense. Yeah. So even if Saudi Arabia doesn't have that, why can't they use literally every other single part of their military? I mean, we would say that like the precision missiles that they're using are like they're targeting two thirds of the time constant like um, non-military targets. So, so they'll use literally any other part of the military. Like a military is the air force, the navy, the army, the right. marines. So we not just precision missiles and missile defense systems. Okay. So A, we would we, what we claim with Dewan is that they get a bunch of their arms from the United States. But they don't get like their troops from the United States. Sure, but what are they gonna arm their troops with? Guns. Like, yeah, which they get from, from which they get from anywhere. From who? From Germany, Russia, China. We, what we tell you is that Germany is recently like the Germany's decreasing. Russia already funds the like, other side. China has Arabia no interest in funding like uh, in militarizing. Are you literally side saying Saudi Arabia like can't get guns without the United States? I'm saying that if you give me a country, I can tell you a reason why they don't want to sell to So them. then why did Russia already offer to deal with Saudi Arabia, giving them anti-tank missiles, rifles, and I'm saying that guns. Russia, why would Russia fund both sides of the civil war? Russia is, is literally funding the Saudi Arabian military. Okay, I would like to see that evidence, because okay. like Russia's already supporting the Iranian side of that war. You can ask me about Like, what's the strategic interest of Russia? But it's probably like to make money for them. Okay, sure. I don't think I know that. I mean, I think it does. Like the fact it's that like a logical war. The fact that they're doing it is what's important. Why they're doing it isn't that important for the debate. I think like why is important for like long term interests. But can I ask you a question? Sure. So let's talk about skyrocketing oil prices. Sure. Wouldn't this hurt Saudi Arabia more than other countries? Why? Well, because like Sa more Saudi more. Arabia is more reliant on the United States for oil than like the United States is on Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia produces one fifth of the oil supply of the world. If the oil, the value of oil increases, right, right, right. but the U.S. only gets ten percent of its oil from Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia doesn't only sell oil to the United States. Fair, but other countries can just look to the United States, right? Like because the United States produces more oil than Saudi Arabia. Maybe Saudi Arabia produces one fourth of the world supply, which is our evidence explicitly so concludes they have the power to single-handedly spike the oil prices of the world. Sure, but like what? The For like the deterioration of the United States and Saudi Arabia alliance. But we would say that there are still four clear reasons why the United States and Saudi Arabia would maintain a strong alliance even if arms sales ended. The first is oil. As the Organization for Economic Complexity finds that 10% of Saudi Arabia's total oil exports were dysfunctional their entire life, and oil products of all their economy flowed to the United States. And second, like the United States oil trade, it, like the entire world oil trade is negotiated in United States dollars. So they rely on our currency for their entire economy. Second, military bases. Even without arms sales, we have lots of military bases set up in the Middle East, and specifically in Saudi Arabia, because that's we want to deter conflict. That means that there's still a guarantee if Iran invades them that they'll respond. Third, there's still part of our nuclear umbrella. As good as Davidson explained, that Washington promised states to like, have, tell states in the Gulf of Arab, right? If anyone to nuke them, then we would nuke them back. That's pretty much our policy with the entire world. But fourth, what we would say is economics. As Walls of the New York Times reports, that's 200, that Saudi Arabian economy or government has $250 billion in assets linked to the United States economy. They need our economy to do well for theirs to do well. What this means is that if you vote for us, we still have leverage over Saudi Arabia. The big change in our world is that we show Saudi Arabia that we're not afraid to use our leverage. That we see them doing these horrible things and we're willing to, that we are willing to cut off arms sales to make them not do those terrible things in the future. And if they keep doing them, we can take away other parts of our leverage. That's the impact. That's how we stop them down the line. But with that, let's go to my opponent's actual argument. 
And the first thing they talk about is like the Saudi Arabia spiking oil prices. I say the two big reasons why Saudi Arabia would never want to do this. One, it'll harm them more than it harms the United States. As well as the New York Times explained, that if Saudi Arabia to cut production, the U.S., who is now the largest export of oil in the world, would be have the ability to ramp up its production and would expand control to an even larger share of the market if Saudi Arabia were to do so. And second, Saudi Arabia can't influence prices that much. As well, New York Times 2018 finds that like, like even though in like 1973 they control the market, they don't have a big enough share of the oil market to fundamentally change the whole world. So again, it would just hurt them in the long term. Which, and three, you can look to these four reasons I just read you as to why the United States and Saudi Arabia still have a bigger line, why Saudi Arabia specifically still depends on the United States. That's really important because they're not going to tank our economy as far as their economy is inextricably linked to us and they still depend on us for defense. They have no sense to do this at all. With that, let's go on to my opponent's second contention about about their arms race. So first, they uh, they say that we like Saudi Arabia loses the United States new like guarantee of security. We say this isn't true, as again we still have military bases there. And then they say that it sends a signal to other countries in the region that their alliances are unstable. We would say the opposite. We would say it sends a signal to every other country that buys arms for us that if they dare to commit human rights abuses, we will stop them from doing so and cut off arms sales to them too. It doesn't make them like afraid that we're going to do it. It's an incentive for them to not commit horrible human rights abuses. That's the entire point of the case. That's why it's, that's why it's really good in the long term. It shows that we're not supporting. These terrible things. But again, hold this, we'd say they're still under the United States' security guarantee. There's no reason to do this. But then, on the idea of an arms race, they say it's asserted that an arms race will like, lead to conflict. The piece of evidence looks like it seems like a one specific example. It said it went from 1 in 100 to 1 in 20. I'd say there are four clear reasons why an arms race actually wouldn't increase the chance of war. First, arms races raise the cost of war, as in both sides have better weapons, so a conflict is more deadly. That means there's more deterrence, as neither country wants to get involved in a war, and it's going to cost them. Second, in fear of losing. These are authoritarian regimes Iran and Saudi Arabia that really don't want to lose a war because it will delegitimize them. If the other side has better weapons, they're less likely to engage in a conflict because they don't want to be embarrassed. Third, we'd say it's their own weapons. Right now, Saudi Arabia functionally has a blank check from the United States that will keep giving them weapons so they can keep fighting the wars. If Saudi is forced to rely on their own weapons, which we tell you happens in our world, that means that they're less likely to get in random wars because they don't have an unlimited supply. But even if you don't fight any of that, I would say the Yemen conflict outweighs because it's here and now. Al Jazeera tells you that there are 130 children dying every single day from Saudi Arabia, and two thirds of them are from Saudi Arabian airstrikes. And the Hill tells you the only reason they're able to do this is because the United States gives them spare parts to keep fueling their planes. What we would tell you is that when you stop any of Saudi Arabia, you stop the Yemen conflict here now and the vast majority of human rights abuses, and that's what I'm very proud to affirm. Can you see one piece of evidence, please? Sure. Uh, whatever you write that says, once we enter ourselves, other countries will be using their abuses. Oh, that, oh, that was analysis. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Is that all right? It's going to start on Tucker's responses to our case. Start on his responses to our case. He first gives you four reasons why the alliance will still stand. Prove them. The security guarantee still goes away. Why? Because we say that arms sales have been a pillar of the alliance for 75 years. When that goes away, it signals that we are not committed to Saudi Arabian defense. Congress would have to pass something that says, like, we are not giving you any more weapons, which means that it is highly unlikely, in Saudi Arabia's perspective, that we would go to war to defend Saudi Arabia, even if we have interest in the region. Having interest in the region and being anti-Iran are different than willing to go to war in Saudi Arabia's defense. Saudi Arabia cannot take the chance that we won't do that, and that's why they need to ramp up their own independent arms, even if you buy that there's still some degree of an alliance. So then they say that, like, we send a message that the human rights abuses across the region will stop. We say instead you'll send a message that the American alliance is uncertain. Prefer our analysis because it, it's carded and also because it makes more sense because they're transitioning away from, other, from the U.S. right now because of the reason they describe. Then they give you like four reasons why arms races will not lead to war. Group them. Two responses. The first is that arms races leads to war because of miscalculation. When Iran and Saudi Arabia view each other as a, as a threat, more of a threat, and they're building offensive capabilities, the chance that they lash out in fear strongly increases. War is never in anybody's best interest. By their own logic, war should never happen ever. But the second response is that proxy wars can still happen, and that's where you're going to see the vast majority of the damages. Proxy wars across the region when Saudi and Iran become more aggressive. Then they say that their Yemen argument outweighs. That's false. Arms race outweighs for two reasons. First, because when arms races happen and Saudi Arabia and Iran view each other as more of a threat, the intensification of existing proxy wars happens, which means the war in Yemen gets worse. But secondly, you see more Yemen-like wars. Because there's more proxy wars, they view each other as more of a threat. The only reason why they say Yemen comes first is because it's happening now. But the arms race that will happen will be far, far worse. And if there's any chance that happens, you're going to see many, many times more Yemens, a much worse scenario in Yemen. 
So go to their case, start on their first argument of terrorism. They're not really going to go for this anyway, but we still think that arms race outweigh because arms race generate the instability that terrorism thrives on. And the second response here is that, they, 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 that Saudi Arabia gave the terrorists small arms, they can get those from anywhere, not just the US, not giving them tanks. Then go to the Yemen argument. They say precision guided missiles are cool. We think that non precision guided missiles are far, far worse. Shalaya Foreign Policy explains that if they transition to other countries that would give them less accurate missiles, they would just kill more civilians. Second of all, we don't think Saudi Arabia needs the highest tech on the market to target Yemen. As they said themselves, they're targeting civilian targets. They're not like heavily defended areas. Then on missile defense, a few responses. First, the missile defense deal that they're talking about literally fell through. They're not buying American missile defense. This doesn't change in either world. Second of all, they are buying Russian missile defense. That happens the same in either world. And thirdly, we think missile defense in Saudi Arabia is probably a good thing because if they're more defended, there's less likely a missile goes through. And if the missile goes through, they will sharply escalate the conflict in Yemen because they will, they will have more at stake. Then they say that like Saudi Arabia provides, America provides the bulk of Saudi Arabia's arms, so we can't transition. Two responses here. First, according to Gauss of the University of Iran, Britain, France, Russia, and China are all willing and able to sell these arms to Saudi Arabia. Moreover, Stratford explains that by 2030, Saudi Arabia is expected to have its own domestic arms industry. They're building it right now. That means either way, those are like four or five avenues that they can get their own arms. Then they say they're not going to have sophisticated weapons. A few responses here. The first is that China is willing to sell them sophisticated weapons, in often cases more sophisticated than the United States. We refuse to sell Saudi Arabia armed drones, China does. We refuse to sell Saudi Arabia certain types of missiles, China does. Thirdly, Saudi Arabia has its own ballistic missile, secondly, Saudi Arabia has its own ballistic missile factory right now, so they can still have these same high-tech weapons. Thirdly, the National Guard, which is like another part of Saudi Arabia's military, like their ground troops, are dependent on Canadian rifles, so that doesn't change in either world. Fourthly, Ottawa of the Wilson Center explains that they're transitioning to Russian arms right now using Russian anti-tank missiles, Russian missile defense, and Russian rifles. That means in either world, they're able to wage this war in Yemen. The difference is that, the, the difference is that it becomes more of a threat. The Rogan of the Washington Examiner explains that the war in Yemen is an existential threat for Saudi Arabia. They can't have an Iran client state on their border. That means the only thing that changes in the world where, in the, in the world where you live for them is an arms race. That A, strengthens Saudi Arabia's capability, but B, their intent because they perceive Iran and therefore a Yemen client state as more of a threat. Um, the small arms card that they were uh, And there was a date on Gauss that uh, uh, the other countries mm -hmm. are willing, ready, and able to. Yeah, sure. Just, I guess. And then we'll see if Russia is already selling the card uh, weapons. Yes. Cool. So you want to see Gauss? Just the date on no, Gauss. No, no, you don't want to. Yeah, just the date. If you have oh, and you want to see the, the Russia card? Yeah. yeah. The, they're buying Russian missile defense card or the transitioning card? The tra no, transitioning to like Russian. Actually, no, we don't need to see the Russia. They're transitioning to Russia, it's fine. All right, so just the data. Just want the data. Just the data. Just the data. Yeah. Missiles go away. Let's assume for some reason or the other that their entire air force goes away and they don't have missile defense. 
why can't they just lob Chinese less accurate missiles or okay. Russian less accurate missiles so we give you their own okay. accurate missiles? So we give you a couple of things. Right? <laughs> First, remember to do Andrew about it, right? That the spare part, like, the refueling spare parts in that sense gives, uh, gives Saudi Arabia, allows them to do the continued air strike. But second, we actually preempt this. I mean, we also pre we preempt this in case, which comes with why I tell you, that the, pre like, the process of switching over your entire missile system from one country to another means that they won't be able to fight the war in the Which is why they already start transitioning a lot of Okay, no, this is the other thing. So in 2018, like, the Stockholm tracker, who's like the biggest tracker of like how many arms go to which country, literally doesn't even have Russia in the database for yeah, how much they sell to Saudi Arabia. But they that's started transitioning their systems to accommodate Russian arms. They buy like less than 1% of their arms from Russia. Yes, right? and that's, that's growing. And they're already transitioning they're their infrastructure. Point one percent. They're, like, they're, they're transitioning their infrastructure to accommodate Russian arms. I mean, I don't know what that means. They, right? They're they, already signing deals right now. Yeah, so then why they haven't they, exactly imported So then why yet. haven't they told the US go or like if you can't be integrated on two systems at once? Like, right well, first of all, they are already. They're integrated on, for example, a lot of their missiles are Chinese and their national guard is the on we're saying the airstrikes they have right? half of their air force are on British typhoons instead of American F-15s they they their okay. entire they they've been heading their this entire time to make sure that if the US ends up okay so, so I say two things like One. it's about that it's a bad savvy strategy to like be able to have the US get pissed off okay I, so I'd say all right so I'd say two things one like your cards from 2010 about England and other countries saying they could sell arms we tell you that since the murder of Khashoggi England France and Germany have decreased no. arms sales Saudi Arabia Germany has France and Britain have they said that yeah I did well, yes. France and Britain have had like political discussions about it, but they haven't done it. Okay, so I mean, I feel like it's unlikely that they take the U.S.'s place as main. But second, like, even if everything you're saying is true, Russia will. we say the airstrikes were, like, rely on the United States technology, which will really kill 130 All trillion right. a day. So, so that's why, that's, okay, so that's my other question, which is, why won't they just use more Chinese missiles? Again, we're saying the time is like it's a, like no, maybe they can already can do that. No, no, they can just buy them and put them on the launch pads. They already use four Chinese missiles. But the air, no, yeah, I mean, but the airstrike precision, like the United States' ability to refuel them, allows them to bomb they the stop, waters. They stop refueling. That's not a thing. But the anymore. spare parts that they're giving them allow the planes to fly for longer. That's why they're upset. That's why. All right, they're so you're just saying that like, it's, it's like marginally less effective for Saudi Arabia I mean, to use Chinese missiles. It's a lot less effective. That's why they're using U.S. missiles in the first place. That's just why. Okay, but either way, they'll still be bombing Yemen. It'll just be like. No, I mean, like in a few years, maybe. They already have Chinese missiles, so they can continue buying Chinese missiles. You have to, you have to switch the system. No, they already have missiles. They already have Chinese missiles, so they already have the technology to launch Chinese missiles. Okay, yeah, but so no, they they have launching missiles and then air raids, which are the bombing raids, because we're saying the bombing raids specifically the ones that are more deadly. I understand, but okay. Okay. missile strikes can be just as deadly. The reason why airstrikes are more deadly is because they launch more airstrikes. No, the reason they airstrikes are more deadly is because you can carry a bunch of bombs with you as you fly. And you can launch multiple missiles in quick succession. You press the red button three times. Their second contention relies on the fact that the United States no longer has a security guarantee 
in Saudi Arabia. This is just plain false. They do not do enough work on the overview Tucker talks about. When we say that there are military bases in Saudi Arabia, this means that if anyone were to ever get into a war in Saudi Arabia, we would have a direct interest in defending Saudi Arabia and getting involved in that war. At this point, Saudi Arabia has no unique incentive to militarize, but on time frame, we're going to outweigh because there's a crisis in Yemen right now where 130 Yemeni children are dying every single day, and they give you this nebulous impact about Saudi Arabia militarizing by 2030 and that triggering some war. But second, they don't do enough work on the second overview Tucker reads you. Then he gives you four reasons why they would never go to war. First, raising the cost of war. They just talk about miscalc, but we would tell you that when you raise the cost of war, Right, their, their, their countries are going to war right now because the cost of war is so low. When you raise the cost of war, these countries won't go to war. But second, with, with these leaders don't want to delegitimize themselves. But then on the main way, you're going to be voting for the affirmative, which is on Yemen. What they basically tell you is that all these countries are going to start selling weapons to Saudi Arabia if the U.S. were to pull out. So let's go through all the actors. Britain. Britain has said that they're going to stop and decrease their sales to Saudi Arabia after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. China. Ahmed tells you that China does not want to get more involved than they currently are in the Middle East. They just want to reap economic benefit. Russia is already selling weapons to the other side of the war, which means that they have a long-term interest in sustaining Iran in the region. And fourth, Saudi Arabia, their own strat for evidence concludes that they will always have to rely on foreign suitors. This is really important because at the end of the day, 130 children are dying every day, and because of their air strikes, which Tucker tells you the Hill, um, in the Hill evidence tells you, needs United States weapons yearly um, to sustain them. Two-thirds of those deaths come through Saudi weapons. You're going to weigh this much more heavily on probability than some nebulous proxy war in the future that my opponents never really even frontline in their rebuttal. And you're going to outweigh on scope because it's the largest humanitarian crisis in the world, which is what the BBC tells you. Because of that, we are very proud to affirm. That was one. Saudi Arabia are fighting each other in a proxy war. That means all of their arguments about why Yemen is bad and why Yemen is the worst humanitarian crisis in history become much worse when you vote for them and the proxy conflict escalates. The second thing that happens is you see more Yemen-like conflicts in other countries like Lebanon and, Israel, or Lebanon and Jordan, which means if you believe Yemen is bad, you should vote for us to prevent more Yemen-like conflicts in the future. They say our argument is nebulous, but they, they do the contextualization for us when they tell you how bad the war on Yemen is. We should prevent the escalation of the war on Yemen, which is why you should vote for the con. 
but on their case anyway, because they lose it pretty handily. They say, we cripple Saudi Arabia's military capability. That's not true, and it threats for a couple of reasons. The first, and most important, is that Saudi Arabia views the war in Yemen as an existential threat against their national security, because they don't want Iran to have a base on their border. That means they'll do whatever it means to fight the war in Yemen. Even if they don't have American planes or American arms, they can use other things from other places. They have Russia giving them weapons in the status quo. They have Chinese missiles in the status quo. They have Canadian guns in the status quo. My opponent's arguments are taking a long time to transition are literally untrue in some of Saudi Arabia is using foreign weapons right now. On our case about the security guarantee, they have two responses by this point in the debate. The first thing they say that Saudi Arabia has military bases which shows our security guarantee. One, we don't have military bases. They can, they can give you a piece of evidence that says we do. But the second, and more importantly, is even if you believe that's true, bases are not a strong enough commitment to Saudi Arabia to show that we are committed to their defense. The Hennigan evidence is very specific in saying it is arms sales that has been the pillar of our alliance for the past 75 years. Once those go away, Saudi Arabia has to arm up and defend themselves alone against the Iranian threat. Finally, they say that arms races and proxy wars don't lead to conflict. Or they say the cost of war increases when proxy wars against the roundness stop the two countries directly fighting each other, it's them arming various groups like a given. Then they say the, these groups fear the countries like fear losing, but proxy wars get around this too, because it's not the countries losing against each other, it's the it's the proxies fighting each other, so countries don't lose out even if they lose the proxy war. Which means either the way that the top already that's why proxy wars come first, they intensify the conflict in Yemen and cause Yemen like conflicts across the region. All right, everyone. <coughs> Alright, cool. The discussion right here. So we have like a bunch of special US equipment in Saudi Arabia right now, right? Where do we keep that? Saudi Arabian military. Saudi Arabian military. Wait. Like, like Saudi Arabia. No, but like I mean we have like people there, presumably. Like help them. Do we just we just like put all the guns on a boat? Like I right, figured this out. How yeah. long? <laughs> 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 Saudi Arabia. No, that's what like, an arm sale is. We sell okay. the arms. Wait, no. But why? They they like, like, we have to help them integrate also, into their like, system. Also, like I'm like ninety-five percent sure. Well, they're sure. already like, we have military bases in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Yeah. Is it free? Do I just want to Google like do we have military bases in Saudi Arabia? We don't have military bases in Saudi Arabia, and unless you can prove a card to the contrary. Like, we, like, we like, uh, do you want me to Google it? Well, no, because it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the first search. So, so the reason it doesn't matter is that even if we have like a couple bases to store engineers in Saudi Arabia, it's not it's also strong enough commitment to their defense as it is literally funding their. That means I mean, I, so I, would like, I would agree like that. Like maybe it's sure, like overall the commitment goes down, so we're less likely to like start more wars. But if we're wrong, we're like engage them directly in the conflict, especially on Saudi Arabia home. Yeah, like, it's more like life. engineers out. We don't declare war on Iran. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If they were to like declare war on on a region where American citizens are, Saudi Arabia, we wouldn't just be like, okay, time to go home, boys. We would say like, it's time to engage in this conflict which had confronted our people. Two things. Don't have bases in Saudi Arabia. We I, do have I, bases I, I, in Saudi Arabia. I just looked through my card file. I have a list of all the bases we have. No, 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 no. Oh my god, then oh, Google, Google, Google it, Sajin. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, that's why oh, we just, oh my god, I Googled it. Look, it's, it's right right a map of Saudi Arabia. Wait, we're not comical. It's on the map. It's on the map. I think I was going to say before the map was that it doesn't matter whether or not we have bases there. Because the security guarantee relies on Congress passing something when Saudi Arabia is attacked that says we go to war. And when Congress... I mean, we go, we, says, go, we like engage in conflict without, like, official declarations of war all the time. But most of the time we don't. No, no, that's not true at all. And Congress has <laughs> like, to authorize budgets for. Like they didn't. I mean, we usually wait, offer wait. authorize plenty of money for our military. I mean, again, like yeah, they have to authorize specific budgets for the war. I mean, I guess I'd say even like really. one, the fact that like we have like military base there, and two, like we have oil interests, even if it's not that high. But the fact that the American economy, yeah. I mean, it's still like benefits of Saudi Arabia being stable. And the signals to Saudi Arabia that we are scaling back our commitments. I feel like it's still saying that we don't like what's even if, wait, wait. So I think this is important. This is important. Even if we scale back our commitments slightly. Which like we're not. Conceived. Then they are uncertain about the American security guarantee. Like, but you have to. But you have to be like pretty, pretty, so, very, very uncertain about no, our. You, you, you have to be very uncertain, uncertain about. All right. So well, because Saudi Arabia probably Saudi knows Arabia that once they militarize, Iran's going to militarize and start triggering this reaction. Saudi Arabia they need to be very uncertain. Hundred percent chance that we will come to their defense. Otherwise. They have to pursue their independent defense because they can't take. I the would chance. say it's the opposite. They wouldn't take the chance what? of militarizing and angering Iran if they knew that if they if they didn't the, know the for a hundred percent. They think for a second that the U.S. does not have their back. back them. Bad things happen because they need the U.S. Okay, we'll take the remaining twenty-two seconds or thirty-two seconds. Sorry.
ready? Not upon security guarantee. Two reasons why, like Saudi Arabia still knows and protect rather than the United States, even if we had arms deals. First is oil. They didn't say the United States doesn't import that much oil from Saudi Arabia, but they're still our second largest like export, like importer of oil. We'd all say that they said we said they were our countries will depend on them. If they were to get invaded, it'd be bad for us. They never protect them. Second, we have military base there. Please include a Google this after the ground. I promise you, military base in Saudi Arabia. That means that American citizens there, if they got invaded, we protect them. That means that Saudi Arabia has no need to like build up their like spend a ton of money to build up their military because they know that the United States will. Protect them if Iran were to invade them. That's not an issue. But then on the idea of armed bases, they just say that armed bases miscalculation and lead to more proxy wars. We'd say two things on this. First, they actually decrease miscalculation because again, if you know the cost of war is really, really high, then you're a lot more likely to really think it through before you start going to war. That's the whole point of an armed base. That's why we haven't seen any major wars between big global powers since nuclear weapons. They really think about going to war as opposed to just doing it for silly reasons. Then on proxy wars, even if proxy wars like, is a little bit true, we'd say holistically they're looking to us. Why? Because if Saudi Arabia has to rely on their own weapons rather than the United States weapons, that means that they're less likely to want to use those weapons and frivolous wars and they'll have to pick and choose instead, which holistically see less proxy wars because they don't have the blank check anymore. That means again, on their case, you're not seeing a whole lot of reasons that the situation gets worse. So to our case on Yemen, the only thing they say is that they can get arms from other, they get arms from other countries. And some may fill up literally goes through every single other actor in the region to you why the US is the only place where they can get these arms, but China's want to get more involved. But even if you don't buy that, number two, Guai tells you that it's really hard to switch weapon systems once you've already integrated, which at least you're seeing a decrease in conflict for five years. That's a good long term. But third, the Hill tells you specifically that American airstrikes from uniquely American weapons kill 130 children every single day in Yemen, which is the very least. They say that the conflict in Yemen is an existential threat to Saudi Arabia, so they'll do it anyway. But we take away their capability to do so. We take their capability away to fight these conflicts for at least a few years. That's really important, because we tell you that one, this is the most probable outcome of the round. You don't know if armed base is going to happen, or you're unsure whether or not they're going to lead more war, but you know that Saudi Arabia's military has less capability, and you know that means they can kill less people in Yemen, and you know that means that that's a really good reason for you to vote pro in today's round. We've been giving you weighing the whole round as to why arms races comes first. They intensify existing proxy wars and lead to more proxy wars. They haven't responded to any of this. The only thing they say is that we're being a little bit vague. They do the contextualization for us. Yemen is just a preview of what's to come if you vote for them. The arms race leads to more Yemen-like conflicts, it leads to a worse situation in Yemen. Every single thing they tell you is bad gets far worse in the long term with an arms race. The only thing, if you buy 100% of what they're saying, that they the impact to is a short-term, as Tucker literally said, five-year decrease in Saudi Arabia's military capability. But when they arm back and they're still in Yemen because they view it as an existential threat, then the war continues, it's just worse. So go to their Yemen argument anyway. They say they've gone through all the countries that can send them weapons, but they haven't. We said that Canada gives them weapons for their National Guard, and they never talks about Canada. Why? Because Canada will still give them weapons, and they don't want to talk about Canada. They say it's hard to switch, but we say they're already switching right now to decrease reliance on American systems. That's why, no matter what you do, the war in Yemen continues. Because they view the war in Yemen as an existential threat. They view their conflict with Iran as an existential threat. They cannot take any chances. So go to our argument. The fact that this is an existential threat to Saudi Arabia also deals with their arguments about the security guarantee. Because once America signals to Saudi Arabia that we are scaling back our commitment, once we end this pillar of the 75-year alliance, Saudi Arabia cannot afford to take chances and has to build up their military to deter Iran because they cannot take chances. They view Iran as an existential threat. Their only response is that we still have continued interest in the region. I'm not even going to get into whether or not we have bases there. But the idea is that either way, Saudi Arabia cannot take chances because this signals a long-term shift in how America 
in how America relates to Saudi Arabia because we're ending the 75-year pillar of the alliance. Why is that important? Because if, when, when Saudi Arabia loses the American security guarantee, they have to arm up past their current capabilities to compensate for the lack of deterrent. That leads to an arms race. That arms race increases the chance of war by five times, increases proxy war. They just say proxy wars don't happen because arms race doesn't lead to that. But we tell you that, that, gets a, that a proxy war gets around all their reasons for why an arms race doesn't lead to war. This goes wrong. Thank you. Thank you.